Welcome everyone. Um, today we are going to move past problem definition that we covered in unit one and begin to focus on policy alternatives. Um, but before we do that, I do want to do a little bit of review um, and so that we're all on the same page about what it is that we're talking about. So where we've been. So we just took the unit assessment um, last Friday about on problem definition. And so the foundation of any policy analysis or the beginning of any policy analysis is assessing the problem definition. And the reason that we do that um, is primarily that we are trying to understand whether or not there is a problem, who is who's affected, who's responsible for fixing the problem, who caused the problem to begin with, etc. Right? This is a starting place because it allows us to understand what the possible solution should be. Um, and as we talked about, the problem definition dictates the solution universe that we consider. So we talked about causal stories. These allow us to assign responsibility. It allows us to tell a story about what the problem is and who's to blame. We talked about the social construction of target populations. Specifically, we talked about how the way that groups are constructed in society influences the types of policies that are likely to be developed, the way we're likely to view a problem that is related to them, and the way that we are likely to think about the solutions that are available to those problems. And then finally, we talked about needs, security, and values, right? So the concept that at their heart, problems are um, people, everybody is trying to define their problem in terms of need, right? And the way that we consider a problem has to do with our own understandings of security, our own values, and the type of need, security, and values that are privileged um, within a particular policy context. So once we've actually figured out what the problem is, you know, what is it that we're talking about? The next step is trying to figure out how we're going to solve that problem. And that is where this notion of a policy alternative comes in. So we're going to talk today about what policy alternatives are and where they come from. Um, and then in the next lecture, we're going to talk about the ways that we assess policy alternatives. So this week we're talking about cost-benefit analysis, and then next week we'll talk about political feasibility and goal alignment. And so these are ways that we evaluate what the best policy is, what the best approach is to addressing a particular problem. Then, after we're finished talking about those policy alternatives, we'll talk about how we actually go about evaluating and implementing policy. Um, so we'll talk about what policy um, what policy and program evaluation is, how we look at unintended consequences and unequal outcomes, and we'll also talk briefly about implementation. Um, but for today, we are going to begin this conversation of what policy alternatives are. So by the end of today, you should understand what we mean by a policy alternative, be able to explain the shortcomings of a linear policy model, be able to describe the concept of multiple streams and explain why this is significant, be able to explain what the three streams are and what a policy window is, and be able to apply the streams theory to policy problems. So what are policy alternatives and where do they come from? So the really easy, straightforward answer is that a policy alternative is a potential solution to a problem or a response to an issue, right? And so at first, this is brainstorming. Um, and so you can imagine how you can imagine how this would work even in your regular life. So if an issue comes up and you're not sure how to deal with it, you might sit down with your friend and and come up with all of the different ways that you might address something. Some of those ways are going to be really, you know positive and other are, you know, realistic and others are not going to be realistic. So the beginning is brainstorming. And just like in, just like when we're trying to figure out what to do in problems in our own lives, over time these are narrowed. So if you're trying to figure out whether or not you should break up with your girlfriend or boyfriend, um, 
or that's not really a great example because that's a yes or no answer. But let's say that you're trying to figure out what to do with the, the future, with your life. At first, anything goes. Maybe you think about going into the circus. Maybe you think about um, becoming an accountant or a, a, a doctor or any number of other things. But over time, those things begin to get narrowed. Maybe you realize that you don't really like blood and gore, so a doctor is out of the question, or you realize that you're not actually interested in, in living a nomadic life, so joining the circus is, is not a good option either. Um, I actually do know someone who, after college, joined the circus, so that is not a, a completely, um, it's not a completely silly example, and actually she has loved it. Um, but for a lot of people, that option would be thrown out, right? That isn't really an option that they would be willing to consider. Um, to reiterate this point, because this is a really important point. So what we consider viable often depends on our problem definition, right? So whether or not you consider go joining the circus to be a viable option has a lot to do with you know, how you're thinking about what the problem is. So is the problem how to figure out how you're going to be happiest in life? Is the problem figuring out how you're going to earn a sufficient amount of money to raise a family? Is the problem defined as how, you know, you are going to stay in, in Michigan near your, near your existing family? Right? Whether or not or how you define the problem, how you define the reason that you're searching for a job for your future is going to influence whether or not you include um, a particular item that you brainstormed in the viable options. And so there, in the policy world, there are a couple of different sources for policy alternatives. So the first are experts. So these are things like policy professionals. And if you're considering a career in, in policy, so these would be people that perhaps work at a think tank like the Brookings Institute. Maybe they work um, in the con a congressional office. Maybe they um, are a lobbyist for a corporation. Lobbyists often come up with, with policy um, possibilities to be able to address issues. Right, so, but these are people who are experts in the field. All right, so they're not necessarily political actors, um, but they're people who have a particular uh, knowledge base or education that allows them to come up with solutions. The next place are politicians. Um, so sometimes politicians have pet ideas, pet projects that they want to get done, and they have they apply those pet projects or pet ideas as solutions to particular problems. The reality about um, po policymakers is that a lot of their ideas and information come from other places, right? So they have a limited amount of time, a little bit limited amount of energy, and are typically, um, excuse me, sorry about that. Um, and so a typical, um, politician gets a lot of help in coming up with their policies and their policy alternatives from experts. And, um, you know, they may have an idea, but they're going to have staffers or lobbyists or policy experts do the research to figure out exactly how something might work. Um, the next place that a, that a policy alternative comes from is what we call a policy entrepreneur. And these are people, we're going to talk more about this in a couple of slides, but these are people who who really feel passionately about something and they're pushing, they're doing a lot of work to push a particular policy alternative. These can be politicians, but they can also be um, community members, they could be uh, the president of a, of a corporation, they could be really anybody who um, has the desire and the authority to sort of become, um, to become a leader in a policy area. Um, and then occasionally we get the public involved. So especially on local issues, we have things like brainstorming sessions um, where we will say, okay, public, you know, we have this issue that we want to figure out, you know, what should we do with, um, what should we do to address the road conditions in, in Lansing? You know, we don't have enough money to really fix them. So what's the best and most equitable way to do it, you know, to, to use the money we do have or, 
or how should we um should we should we allow medical marijuana in our in our communities or what should the rules be around that you know various things and so people would come up with different alternatives um Actually, in Detroit, there has have been a lot of efforts to involve the community in figuring out what the best solution is to actually be able to begin to revitalize the city. And so occasionally policy alternatives or, or problem alternatives, the way that we're thinking about things will come from the public. Um, and then policy professionals, as I mentioned before, um, are likely experts, right? They fall into that category, but not always. And what I want to... What I mean by that is um, sometimes policy professionals work on general issues, right? So they they don't have a particular specific expertise. They are hired out, for example, um, by various organizations who want them to do research on a topic or want them to figure out a policy alternative. And so they would go to an expert in the field. So let's say with the road issue, let's say that um, that the state of Michigan wanted to figure out what is the best solution for dealing with our our really horrible roads. And so they went and they hired um, a policy research firm, the policy professionals, to do some research on that. Well, one of the first places that policy professional would start, since they are not an expert on the roads, is going back and talking to people who are experts on the roads. So maybe these are structural engineers, Maybe these are the people who actually run the road crews um, and, and, and are, are actively involved in doing road repair work. Um, maybe these are transportation experts, so people who study the use and, um, and degradation of roads, um, etc. Okay, so policy experts may, uh, or policy professionals may or may not be experts in the field. Now, I want to talk to you, so that's that's sort of where policy alternatives come from. Um, but I think it's important to also talk about the process and the policy process, okay? So um, the way that our class is set up and also the way that many people think about policy is in a really linear process, okay? So you start out with a problem. Um, the roads are really bad. Okay, and then you start brainstorming and you come up with some solutions. So maybe the solution is that we're going to increase um, the, the gas tax by one-tenth of one cent so that we can increase our road funds, right? So then we pick that, we would implement that policy, right, which means that we would actually put it into practice. So we, we would start increasing the price of gas by one-tenth of one cent for every gallon. Um, and then... The, the goal is that we would have change in the problem. So we would generate enough revenue with this one-tenth of a cent increase in tax to imp help improve the road conditions. Okay, and this is the way that many people think about policy, right? This is the way, it's sort of in an ideal world, we think, oh, well, you know, the people who are, are elected officials are going to notice a problem, they're going to develop a solution to that problem, they're going to fix the problem. Okay. Um, and that's okay, it's an okay to way to think about it. Sometimes this is the way that policy works, but more often than not, it's a more complicated and less linear process than this. And so one of the ways that we think about the policy process is in multiple streams. So this is a concept that was developed first by John Kingdon. Um, and what he argued is that policy, or problems, policy, and politics exist and what he would identify as separate streams. And what he means by that is that they're independent of one another. That problems exist, policy exists, and politics exist all at the same time. And that those things only come together through a policy entrepreneur when there is a policy window that opens. And those things bring the policy entrepreneur and the policy window bring the three streams together to develop policy. So if we look at a diagram of this, this is what it would look like. Okay, so you have the problem. So let's say we have bad road conditions. Okay, then we have proposals to, sol to solve that, pro that problem. And we have politics going on all at the same time. And it's only when a policy entrepreneur works to bring those three things together 
that and open a policy window that we see actual policy change. So let's look at what this would what this would look like in a real example. Okay, so this is the multiple streams example using public transportation. So the solution or policy is to increase public transportation through larger bus fleets and high speed rail. Okay. Um, now this is something that's really popular right now. Um, and is particularly if you're younger, if you're 18, 19, 20 in that range, this might seem like something that is really in response to a lot of our environmental problems. But the reality is that this solution has existed on it on its own for decades. And people have tried to apply this solution to various problems over time. So um, in the 1970s, there was an oil crisis. It made the, the price of gasoline go up a lot. And the, and the response to the oil crisis for some people was saying, oh, look, gas is really expensive. What we should do is develop public transportation. We can reduce the cost of transportation for a lot of people. Okay, so that got a little traction, um, not too much. The oil crisis ended. People sort of forgot about it. Public transportation went back to not being really, you know, on the table. Um, then in the 1980s, we have economic instability. And so people are poorer, right? They, um, there's a big economic recession. People are losing their jobs. And so what is cheaper than driving your own car? Taking public transportation. And so again, this solution comes up as this is the way that we should address some of this economic instability. Okay. Um, and so that gets a little bit of traction, but eventually the economic recession goes away and public transportation becomes less of an issue. Um, then in the 1990s, we're dealing with really congested cities, right? We have um, a lot of people moving back into cities, and that means that we have a real increase in congestion. And again, these people, or people begin to suggest, oh, what's the solution to congestion? public transportation. We can have buses, we can have high-speed rail. That will reduce congestion. Okay, so congestion doesn't really improve. We still have a lot of congestion in cities, um, but public transportation gets some traction there. Then in the 2000s, climate change becomes a really big issue where we're talking about our carbon emission, our carbon footprint, and the response to reducing carbon emissions through automobiles is, wait for it, public transportation. And so the argument, according to Kingdon, would be that the solution existed independent of the problem and that there were people who were going to push that solution regardless of what the problem was. Right? They're looking for politically opportune problems that they can make the argument that public transportation is the best solution. Um, and so in each of these cases, there would be different sort of what we would consider policy entrepreneurs. But what allowed the what allowed them in each instance to push public transportation was that the oil crisis, the economic instability, the congestion as a real problem, and climate change as a growing issue created a political environment um, and a policy window that would allow those that solution to be considered. So what is a policy entrepreneur? What are we talking about? So like a business entrepreneur, these individuals have an idea and they attempt to turn it into a viable policy option. So as I mentioned before, this could be a politician, a policy professional, an area expert, an interest group, a non-governmental organization, etc., etc. But the key is that they advocate for their policy and invest their own resources. So this means time and money into pushing the solution. And so in the case of public transportation, you might have a politician who is really um, believes strongly in public transportation, or you might have a um, nonprofit organization or an advocacy organization like Greenpeace who's really pushing for it as, in response to whatever their um, social issue is, their, their cause is. Um, you might have an interest group uh, that's really pushing for it. So for example, um, you might have you know, uh, train manufacturers or bus manufacturers who are pushing for it. So it could be a lot of different people, but they're going to put in their own money. They're going to put in money for time. They're going to put in time and money to do their research to develop this policy. Um, and this is really important, okay, because 
Um, the thing that policymakers are really lacking is time, right? And that, and the and so what this policy entrepreneur does is put in the time and energy to figure out what the best solution is, to do the research behind it, to lobby for this policy, um, to highlight the benefits of this policy or this solution over other policies. Um, and so if we look at some of the, uh, some recent policies, there's some examples. So we had the Affordable Care Act. And in this instance, we have a politician, the president, who was really the policy entrepreneur. He's the one who's out there advocating for this. He's going on national television. He's telling everybody this is the best solution. He's meeting with congressional leaders, etc. Okay. Another example. So um, 25 years ago, uh, there was... There were, were there were much more lenient laws on drunk driving, and but a, one of the ways that this really changed is that MAD, which is Mothers Against Drunk Driving, it's um an advocacy organization, a non governmental organization, began to push. They put started doing research, putting their own resources into pushing for stricter drunk driving laws. Um, in terms of an interest group, so. Uh, in the 1980s, we saw deregulation of banks and investment firms, right? And you can guess who was pushing for that, right? Banks and investment firms, interest groups. Um, and for another example, so in the 1960s and early 1970s, the government started what they called a war on poverty, right? It was a real effort to try and um, fix a lot of the, the systemic problems that drive poverty. And so they wanted to, the government wanted to improve conditions. And they turned um, for advice to social scientists who began to push very hard on particular policy responses. But some of those policy responses were adopted in limited ways, others not. But the social scientists or the experts became the policy entrepreneurs. Okay. So the key here is that these are people who believe very strongly in the policy and they're putting their time, energy, and money into pushing for this policy. So there are a couple of considerations when we think about um, policy alternatives. So the first is technical feasibility. So can this actually happen? So if we're talking about this transportation issue and we're talking about how to improve congestion, and in cities. We might put on the list that we should all be in flying cars or have teleportation devices, but the reality is it's not technically feasible, right? So we can sort of check that off the list. The next is value acceptability. And so we talked about um, values. We talked about values a little bit at the end of Unit 1, right? but these are the things that the public believe to be important. You know, so for example, we talked about equity versus efficiency, liberalism versus conservatism. And so we have to consider, is, are the policies that we are considering likely to be accepted by the public? Are they consistent with our values? And so um, one of the big conversations that's happening right now in public that has to do with this value acceptability is about surveillance and privacy, right, with the NSA. And so the, the question here is, should the NSA, is our, is our freedom um, more important, right? Is that the value that's more important or is security more important? And is it, is it acceptable? Is, it, is this policy going to be viable to have surveillance if what, it, what the public believes is most important is freedom, right? And the answer is probably not. Uh, at least not if it's out in the public, right? If you have these, if you have surveillance that nobody knows about, well, then value acceptability is significantly less important. Um, the next one are, is the anticipation of constraints. And so we must be able to predict the constraints that politicians and the public will have towards um, the particular policy. And so these might be um, budget, it might be political support, it might be public support or political climate, right? There are gonna be a, a variety of constraints. Uh, if, if, for example, it's a great policy, it's a great solution, but it costs way more than you can generate revenue for, there isn't any money for it, 
well, that's not going to be the right policy. And so sometimes the best policy or the best solution to address a problem isn't going to be chosen because it doesn't have technical feasibility, it's not consistent with our values, or there are other constraints like public support or budget short, you know, budget budgetary constraints that are going to make it be less than an optimal solution. Okay. So we talked about the policy entrepreneur. We talked about the policy and whether that, you know, what might dictate whether the policy entrepreneur picks a particular policy. But then we have the political stream. So this is this is Kingdon's third stream. And what are we talking about? So one thing we're talking about is the national mood, right? So these are public attitudes and sentiment sort of generally. Are things um, really liberal or really conservative? So, for example, or um, we talked about at the end of last unit, we talked about um, 9-11 a little bit, and we talked about um, the Patriot Act, right? And so when the Patriot Act was was passed, the public attitude was really, really um, in favor of security measures. And there was a conservatism, a patriotism that was that was um, was prevalent, right? It permeated the, the national mood. Um, the other thing that influences national mood, right? So or, or public attitudes and sentiment are these objective conditions. And so in that case, the terrorist attacks on 9-11 created objective conditions that influenced public attitudes and sentiment. And so this creates, um, it creates an environment where policy is possible or not possible, right? So the Patriot Act passed very quickly because the national mood was in favor of security measures. But if we had been talking about a policy to increase immigration from the Middle East at that time, or make it more, more easier for people from the Middle East to come into the country, the likelihood that that would have passed or would have passed easily is much lower because national mood also unfortunately became quite um, anti-Middle East, anti-Muslim, anti, um, anti-many sort of racial groups that were not white. Right? There was a real uh, a negative national mood in that respect. And so policies of that nature wouldn't have been likely to pass because the national mood was different. The next thing that's involved in the political stream are pressure or interest group campaigns. Right? And so these are, um, you know, we can we can sort of think about what would, what we're talking about in this case pretty easily. Right. So these are. Um, these are groups outside of government who are pushing government to do something. And they're involved in whether or not something is going to be politically feasible. Because the interest groups are highly involved in our, in our political system. And so the extent to which they are involved in a particular campaign affects whether or not the political, what's going on in that political stream. The next thing is election results and the timing of election. So on the one hand, in terms of election results, um, when you have newly elected people, um, particularly if you change the party of the, of the office, right? So let's say we have our congressional elections coming up and it, we change out you know, people, a couple of seats that used to be Republican are now Democrat, a couple that were Democrat are now Republican, et cetera, okay? So when you get new people in, um, oftentimes there is a sense that those people have a mandate to change things. So whatever it is that they ran on in terms of their campaign or whatever it is that they really stand for, um, there is a sense with which, you know, we believe or the politician themselves believes that by being elected, it allows them to do particular things or it, it makes it possible, right, that the, the, the public has suggested that that's what they want. Okay, but the timing of elections are also important. And so there are many things that politicians won't do right before an election because it would be unpopular, because it would reduce the likelihood that that politician was going to be elected. Whereas right after the election, they can much more easily do something, right? Or in the case of like the president of the United States, because we have term limits, only two terms, um, in the second term, they're, they're sort of one, much freer to do whatever it is that they want to do because they're not going to be trying to be reelected, but two, have 
sometimes have what we consider to be a lame duck, um, a lame duck uh, presidency or presidential term, right? Because because they're not going to be reelected, and so there is less incentive for other um, political mem people to work with them, right? And so the elections really really influence this political stream. Then you have things that we think about as politics, right? So this is the um, partisan composition of Congress and whether or not um, the, the Senate and the House are, have the same dominant party, whether or not those are consistent with the president, right? These, these things really influence the political stream as do any changes in the administration. So every time the president gets reelected, or not reelected, but a new president comes in, um, they change the heads of their administration, right? They change the heads of our bureaucratic agencies, etc. And those can have real influences on the policy that come that comes out. Okay, so all of these things though are happening regardless of the problems that exist and regardless of the solutions that exist. That's what Kingdom is saying, right? So. There is a political environment that is independent of any given policy. And that when we think about how policy comes into being, we have to think about what's happening in that political stream as well as what is happening in terms of the problem and in terms of the solutions, right, that are all happening simultaneously. And what he argues is that in order for those three streams to be connected, what we have are policy windows. And these happen when the separate streams come together, right? Um, but the important part is that the governmental agenda is the same as the decision agenda. And what that means is that what the government is paying attention to um, is the same as what is needing to be decided on in terms of this policy. And when those things happen, when these streams come together, uh, that is when we have a decent chance of actually enacting policy. And windows open because typically there's a change in the political world, right? And so maybe somebody new is elected to office. You have a new president, and you have new congressional, um, a new party that's that's the dominant in the House or the Senate, right? Something has changed, or when a new problem catches government attention, because the reality is is that government has very limited attention, right? You have a lot of problems in the world. You have a lot of things, a lot of moving parts, and, and government is not paying attention to all of those things all at once. And so when a, a new problem catches the government's attention, that's when we're likely to see something happening. So, um, for example, oh, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago, um, the media began to report on kidnappings really a lot and began to bring national attention to kidnapping. And uh, for the public, this felt like kidnapping was getting a lot worse, even though nothing had actually changed in terms of the actual numbers of children being kidnapped. Um, what had changed was the way that the media was reporting. And so this prompted the government to really begin to pay attention to, our, to kidnapping as an issue. And the government developed the Amber Alert system. Uh, in response to this new attention. And so it doesn't have to be a brand new problem, right? Because problems are rarely brand new. But what it is is that it's a new, it's a, the problem has newly attracted government attention. But windows close for a, a variety of reasons too. So for example, the problem gets addressed, right? So it's just no longer an issue. We can think about this in terms of um, the hole in the ozone layer. So making um, the aerosol chemicals illegal, like ma making it so that we're not using those has just drastically reduced um, the hole in the ozone layer and it's become in a lot of ways a non-issue, right? Um, but this also happens, so that's the positive side. So somebody acts and the problem gets addressed. But windows also close when there is a failure to get action or when somebody works really hard but there isn't a solution that emerges, or there isn't, uh, even if a solution emerges, the problem doesn't get better. So people get, you know, they get um, disillusioned with things. They get worn out. They stop fighting for it. They stop paying attention for it and to it. And all of a sudden, where there used to be the possibility of passing policy, now there really isn't anymore. 
And sometimes this happens because we do have a really serious problem and people are paying attention to it, but there isn't a solution, right? We don't know. There isn't a, maybe it's, maybe it's a problem that technology has yet to address, or maybe it's a problem that is so endemic and so, such a part of human life that there, we just don't know of a solution. Um, so these are things that, but when that policy window closes, it means that policy is much less likely to be passed on an issue. Um, and so to just give you a slide that reiterates this, if we use the Patriot Act that we talked about last time, in terms of the problem, we have this focusing event of 9-11 that made terrorism and national security the center of the political agenda, right? And so immediately, um, we have uh, we have this policy that emerges, and and the reality is is that the original legislation didn't have a clear entrepreneur. Um, but in terms of reauthorization, and the reason, let me re say a little more on that. And the reason that it didn't ha necessarily have a clear entrepreneur was that the political the political stream, the national mood, um, and and the focus, everybody was focused on national security. Right? They didn't need to be an entrepreneur because everybody wanted to see it happening. But four years later, um, when it was needing to be reauthorized, there was less sort of dominant public support. The public mood was was still very patriotic and very pro-security, but people were beginning to have doubts about what was happening. And so there, there wasn't just this overarching, like everybody is going to love it um, sort of approach. And so you needed, we needed... Um, a policy entrepreneur in this case. And George W. Bush and Pat Roberts became those um, those policy entrepreneurs really pushing for uh, the policy to be reauthorized. In terms of the political stream, so originally we have a national mood that was pro-security. Um, presidential approval was record high. Uh, there was just a, a, a tremendous opportunity, right? The, the policy window was super wide open and the political stream was really supportive. When reauthorization came about though, um, there was this growing skepticism, but nonetheless, the political mood was still really pro-security. And so, um, and in addition, George W. Bush had just been reelected and presidential approval was still high. And so there was a sense that there was a mandate, right? The public had given George W. Bush a mandate to continue his previous practices. Um, and so and so it was reauthorized, right? The policy window existed. Um, but if Congress had not passed that legislation so quickly initially, um, for example, like let's say that they were trying to pass the same legislation today, chances are that that legislation would not pass, um, or at least wouldn't pass so easily, because the, the political mood has made has changed objective conditions have changed. You know, now we know that there really were no weapons of mass destruction. We've had wars that have dragged on and on and on. Um, there have been these major violations of our of our privacy um, and a lot of distrust of government as a result of the NSA's um, uh, surveillance. And so the, the national mood is radically different. And chances are that this policy would not have been able to be um, passed if it, we were trying to do it today. So this is a really good example of understanding how um, these policy windows are, are, are short-lived and dependent on the problem, the policy, and the politics of the time aligning. Okay, um, and so this is, that's what I want you to know for this, for this lecture, right? So to reiterate, a policy alternative, these are just the solutions that we come up with um, in order to actually be able to solve a problem. We're going to talk in the next lecture about one way to evaluate a policy alternative, which is cost-benefit um, evaluation or analysis. Um, but at this point, you're thinking about policy alternatives as exactly that, alternatives, right? There are multiple options, multiple solutions, and um, we're trying to figure out what is the best one. So as we're moving forward for this week,
you had readings on cost benefit analysis and there are readings and lectures. So I'll post um, the cost benefit lecture tomorrow or on Monday, late in the day. Um, you're going to be reading congressional testimony on energy independence. Um, so you're going to want to look for the different ways that the problem is constructed and how the different policy alternatives that are suggested differ based on that problem definition. Okay. And then we'll have a, I'll have a brief lecture on energy independence and these different solutions. So the assignments that are due, there's a discussion post due on Thursday and a response to post due on Sunday. Um, if you have any questions, as always, please email. Oh, I, there is one thing I wanted to say, which is that um, you will get your unit assessments. I'll have them graded midweek. Um, and uh, several people emailed me about the timing um, that they just felt like there wasn't quite enough time. And so in this next for ne unit assessment two, you will have um, an hour and a half to complete the assessment. Uh, so if you need to set up office hours, you have questions about your policy analysis that's coming up, your, um, your summary, which is due now in just four weeks, uh, please send me some questions or set up office hours. Okay, I hope that you are well and I will talk to you um, very soon. Bye-bye.